It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circum circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I want to talk this morning about this scripture passage that we read this past week in the one-year Bible from Galatians chapter 5 about preserving our own freedom. So let's bow together for prayer. Father, we thank you that we live in a free country. But more importantly, you have given us freedom in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Father, we'll see that truth today and exactly what that means for us as we live our lives before you. I pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight because, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, aren't you glad? We live in a country that values and promotes freedom. A land founded on the principles of liberty. And even though we may, and especially in the last few years perhaps, sometimes feel like the government is trying to encroach on those freedoms, we still live in a pretty amazing nation compared with other countries around the world. And freedom is at the heart of the beginning of our country. We sing about these attributes in songs written about America. Think about the songs we sing. Our country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. Of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. The national anthem, oh say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave? Or America the beautiful, oh beautiful for pilgrim's feet whose stern, impassioned stress, a thoroughfare of freedom beat across the wilderness. See, freedom's at the heart of what it means to be an American. We love, in, in, the, in America, we love, we value freedom. And you and I should be grateful that we live in a country that values freedom. Grateful to God for that. Freedom is a fundamental concept in understanding American history. But did you know that freedom is also a fundamental idea in understanding the Christian life? I mean, listen again to that first verse we read earlier from Galatians chapter 5. Here's how Paul starts it. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Paul basically says here, the same thing about spiritual liberty that Patrick Henry stated about physical liberty when he said, give me liberty or give me death. As important and as valuable as physical freedom is, spiritual freedom is even more vital to who we are as people. So let's think about that this morning. Stand firm, Paul says. Stand firm in your freedom. 
Someone once stated, it's a famous quote, I should have looked up who it is, but they said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Someone is always trying to encroach on your freedom. And in the Christian life, someone is always going to try to take away the freedom you have in Christ. And keeping your freedom in Christ calls for eternal vigilance. Some, someone will always try to put you back under what Paul calls the curse. And many times, the person who does that the most is you. <laughs> but not always. Other people will always be more than happy to encroach on your freedom, to enslave you again to the law. So let's look at that. What are those things? Things that encroach on your Christian freedom. First one is this. Trying to please people rather than pleasing God. If you look at verses 2 and 3, which we read, Paul said this, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, which the Jewish believers were trying to tell the Gentiles they had to do, if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Yeah, there were other people that came to the church that Paul started there in Galatia telling them they had to be circumcised like the Jews. In other words, they had to become Jews before they could become Christians. They were saying a person had to do that before they could come to know Christ even, or give their heart to Christ. They had to become a Jew. And so Paul told these Gentile believers, don't fall for it. You are responsible for maintaining your own freedom. See, other people came from the outside. They were making unwanted obligations, unwanted expectations of them. But they were responsible for maintaining their own freedom. And if they went ahead, Paul says, if you go ahead and you get circumcised, then they were responsible for that choice. And no one took their freedom away from them. They gave it away the moment they tried to live up to other people's expectations that were outside of the will of God. Okay? And other Christians can do that to us or try to do that to us. I heard about a new pastor, a younger pastor that moved to a rural congregation. And the first week he was there, he preached. And one of the deacons from the church came up to him afterwards and said, you know, I just wanted to let you know, the, the, pa the pastor who was here before you, he used to always mow the lawn for us during the week. And the new pastor said, oh, okay. Second Sunday, came back for service. Pastor preached a sermon. It was obvious nobody had mowed the lawn that week. The deacon came up to him again and said, uh, you know, I told you, the pastor before you mowed, mowed the lawn, uh, you know, during the week for. And he said, yeah, I, I heard that. Okay. Thank you. Third week, back again. No lawn mowed. Deacon, a little agitated this time, said, I thought I told you the last pastor mowed the lawn for us. The new pastor said, yeah. I called him this week. He said he doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> What happens when we try to live up to other people's expectations? Two consequences. Two very serious consequences. Paul says that Christ will have no value for you. Why? Because you've decided to follow other people instead of following Him. And secondly, Paul says, now you're obligated to obey the whole law. In other words, this is a game you don't want to play. Once you start trying to live up to other people's expectations, the expectations never end. Believe me, if these people were circumcised, if they did what they were being asked to do, the expectations would not end there. There would be a next step, and then another, and then another. You've had people in your life like that, haven't you? You try and you try and you try to please, but the expectations never end. And pretty soon, you're robbed completely of your joy and your peace and all the things you used to find in Christ. 
So trying to please people rather than pleasing God. A second thing that encroaches on our freedom in Christ is forgetting our source of liberty, which is God's grace. At verse, verse 4, Paul said this, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now some people have tried to use this verse to say that you can fall out of salvation. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. When we start trying to please God by obeying the law, we have forgotten what grace is all about. We have fallen away from grace. But as Christians, Paul says, we are not under the law, we are under grace. Here's the truth. We can never live good enough lives to gain God's acceptance and love. We didn't begin our relationship with God that way, and we cannot continue our relationship with Him that way. His grace, as we experience it, constantly is changing us, conforming us to be more and more and more like Jesus. But that process is never completed in this life. It really isn't about how good we are. It's about how good God is. And so the real question is, have you really experienced the grace of God? Let me tell you, because if you have, you can never be the same again. I mean, if, if you really believe that you can come to Christ and you can experience His wonderful, undeserved grace and you can establish a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross and then go out and live your life as if what He did for you doesn't really matter then you don't really know what grace is all about. What is our motivation for living the Christian life? Paul says this in Romans 12, verse 2, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And notice what he said. I beseech you by the mercies of God not, I beseech you by the wrath of God. I beseech you by the legal requirements of God. No, I beseech you by the mercies of God. It's all mercy. It's all grace. Grace. And if we forget that, then we forget what our Christian freedom is founded on. The third one is this, depending on outward forms and rituals, rather than inward faith expressed in love. Listen again to verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You know why we get back into keeping rules? Because it's always easier to depend on outward manifestations to determine your worth. Because at least, if I know what the bar is, and I meet the bar, then I know I've done enough. And that's the way we think. I went to a denomination as a kid. I, I'm glad I grew up in this faith, but, but you would get a, an offering envelope as a child every Sunday, and it had boxes to check. Worship attendance, 30%. Bible reading, so and so. If, so you got to grade yourself. You know, you hoped you got made at least a 70, so you had a passing grade. And if you got all the boxes checked, there you are, 100%. You get to put a gold star on your head. Well, that's the way Paul's talking about here, circumcision. You want a gold star on your head? You've got to be circumcised. So whether it's circumcision, whether it's Sunday school attendance, whether it's worship service attendance, or reading my Bible every day, or saying some prayers every day, I mean, those are all good things to do. Great things to do. But if you're looking to that to find approval with God, that's not what it's all about. And that kind of way of looking at the Christian life works against us in one of two ways. It either gives us a sense of false security, like 
if we're doing those things, if we're doing all that stuff, then everything must be okay. Or if somebody has a very sensitive conscience, then it doesn't matter what they do. They never feel like they've done enough. They realize they can never be good enough for God to like them. And they keep trying and trying and trying, but they can never get there. So what counts? What matters? Paul tells us. Faith expressing itself through love. I'll give you a little bit of a side note here. Preaching the law will keep you from persecution. That's what Paul said here. He said, brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Because in that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. What's he saying there? If Paul had gone along with those touting the law, he would have avoided being persecuted. But he wouldn't go that way. But that's still true today. I want to tell you, at least I've noticed, if you preach law, some people will really like it. Sometimes I've preached some really hard-hitting sermons. Maybe I've dabbled a little bit in preaching rules. Maybe I've gone a little bit to the extreme and I've preached a guilt-producing sermon with very little grace in it. And invariably, after the service, some people will tell me, that was a great sermon, preacher. You really stomped on my toes. Why is that? What is it about those kinds of sermons that speaks to us? And I include myself in that. And here's the reasons. The reasons we like laws and rules. First of all, it pleases our prideful desires. We start believing that we can do something to earn favor with God. And as long as we can do something, we can have some pride. But that is totally antithetical to the gospel. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any person should boast. If you and I could do something to earn our salvation, or if we can do something to even keep our salvation, then we can feel good about ourselves. We can boast. But it also, according to Paul, abolishes the offense of the cross. The cross is a constant reminder, and the reason it offends people sometimes is it reminds us there's nothing you or I can do to earn our salvation. It's either the cross or it's us. It's either grace or it's the law. It's not a combination. It is not a both and statement. It's an either or. Martin Luther, who began the Protestant Reformation, was asked by his Catholic inquisitors because they couldn't believe what Martin Luther was espousing. He, they said, I don't, I don't think I've shared this with you all yet, but they asked Martin Luther, Martin, what do you contribute to your salvation? And his response was, only the sin that makes it all necessary. So it pleases our prideful desires. The second thing is, as I mentioned a little earlier, some of us like to feel guilty. We have a need to feel guilty. And if we get our weekly dose of guilt, then we feel better about ourselves. Like getting punished by our parents when we were little. We, we, we get our weekly whipping, and then we go home and we wait for next week's punishment. But the sad thing is, it doesn't change our lives. Because guilt is no substitute for grace. And thirdly, we like to scapegoat. We like to point at other people's sins. Like in this passage about circumcision. They were pointing fingers at others. You're not good enough. You need to do this. And it made Paul very angry. Very angry. We didn't read verse 12. Here's what Paul said. As for those agitators, 
I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. I wish they'd just go ahead and castrate themselves. That's what he's saying. Now that's angry. <laughs> so he's upset. Because this is very important. Don't put yourself back under the law. Don't put yourself back under the curse. Preserve your freedom in Christ. So the, the final section this morning is this. So what does real Christian look what does real Christian freedom look like? How does it look? Well, first of all, unlike what we think of when we think of freedom, not selfish indulgence, but unselfish service. Our freedom isn't really about us. It's not about turning inward. It's about turning outward and sharing with and serving others. Verses 13 and 14 that we read. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, our freedom in Christ frees us to serve others. Not indulge ourselves. It's what Jesus called denying yourself. And the only way we can do that is by being immersed in God's grace. Getting ourselves off of our hands. Being so convinced of God's love for us that we can then turn outward and look at the needs of others. So often what we think we're doing when we say we're loving others is really trying to get them to love us. It's not unselfish. The only way we can do that is if we're filled up with the love of God ourselves. It's like, you know, when you get on an airplane and if you have a child with you, they tell you if, if the oxygen masks come on, what are you supposed to do? What do you do? Put it on first. And, and as a parent, your first reaction is going to be, I want to make sure my kid is taken care of. But you cannot help your child if you don't, if you don't have that source of oxygen in yourself. You cannot love the way God's called you to love if you haven't experienced that love first yourself. And it flows out of that. Breathing deeply of God's love and grace ourselves so we can turn and reach out to help somebody else. And secondly, what it looks like, not outward judgmentalism, but inward soul searching. Verse 15, he said, If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So this is a word of caution for people wanting to find fault with others. I don't have to tell you, not, not in a Christian context necessarily, but that's what we see happening in our country right now. But Paul tells those Christians to stop it or you will destroy yourselves. See, what happens when we start pointing fingers? We keep whittling down and whittling down to those who are righteous enough. And pretty soon, all that will be left is you and me. And I'm not real sure about you even. That's what happens. And the last one, by living in the Spirit. Paul goes on in chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. We didn't read them uh, first uh, at the beginning, but listen to how Paul says living in grace, living by the Spirit looks like. He says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. See, that goes against our idea of freedom. Paul says here, you are not to do whatever you want. I mean, that's what we think freedom means. But that isn't real freedom. It's being free enough to choose to do what the Spirit of God desires for you. Not law, but grace. Not a curse, never feeling like you're measuring up, but a constant fee and, and having a constant feeling of never being enough in God's sight. 
but freedom. Real spiritual freedom. It means at the very heart of your life saying, I'm going to stop trying to measure up and I'm going to start trusting for God to continue to do His work in my life. Trusting that God's grace is bigger than any sin, any mistake, bigger than my past. Trusting that God's grace and God's Spirit truly resides within me. And trusting, as the Bible tells us, that He will guide me into all truth. He will convict me of sin. He will teach me all things. And He will flow through me to minister to others. If I will only let Him. And that's what true freedom is all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Real freedom. Freedom to get ourselves off of our hands. Freedom to deal with the sin in our life. Freedom to be uh, uh, vessels that you can use. That kind of freedom. Freedom to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to use what Paul says, because of your mercy, because of your grace, not because of your command or demand on our lives, but your great love for us. So help us to experience your love in deeper ways every single day, to grow in your grace and your love so that we can truly experience what freedom is all about, freedom to choose the right thing, freedom to serve you, freedom to be used by you. That's real freedom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing...